Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Friday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. We have good, good, and crazy martinis today for conservatives. And, Jim, let's start with the good, and hopefully this is good news for everybody, not just conservatives. This is courtesy of ABC News. A man accused of making at least eight threats against Jewish community centers, Jewish schools, a Jewish museum, and the Anti-Defamation League was arrested by the FBI in St. Louis, Missouri this morning, though the man is not believed to be the main suspect behind this year's rash of bomb threats, two law enforcement officials told ABC News. Juan Thompson, 31, is accused of what federal prosecutors called a, quote, campaign to harass and intimidate, unquote. He's charged in New York with cyber-stalking a New York City woman by communicating threats in the woman's name. Prosecutors said Thompson appears to have made those threats, quote, as part of a sustained campaign to harass and intimidate the woman after their romantic relationship ended. So instability, not a shock uh, in someone who would do something like this, uh, Jim. But as mentioned, there are still uh, efforts to find others responsible for this because, as ABC reports, Thompson's arrest comes after nearly 100 Jewish community centers and schools nationwide received bomb threats this year in five separate waves. So kudos to the FBI for making progress here. Hopefully this uh, is the tip of the iceberg in finding everyone who's responsible for this uh, because it needs to get rooted out quickly. It does, Greg. And and yet, on the one hand, we're celebrating. This is fantastic that we caught the guy. Um, Although apparently this is, you know, it's a small fraction of them. And and from the moment this story kind of came up, I kind of left my and and we kept getting kept coming in waves and it would be in, you know, uh, 10 to 20 in one one wave. And then a week later, you get about, you know, another another group. And it seemed like a very strange pattern to this. this, Clearly, you know, it wasn't just some, you know, obnoxious, dumb teens or something. This seemed to be very plot, very coordinated. Um, I was talking with somebody earlier this week, and they said they're they're real concerned because there never was any bombs, thankfully. Um, but obviously, every time you get a bomb threat, you have to evacuate. And they kind of wondered if this was some sort of uh, terrorist probing of a sort, of trying to figure out what people's response times are, how they react to a threat like this. Um, and his fear, obviously, that someday this would not be just a bomb threat, uh, but an actual terrorist attack that would follow up upon this. This guy, Juan Thompson... Uh, I'm going to use a technical term, Greg. This guy is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. I mean, you want to talk about layer upon layer of crazy. Um, it appears we have another Stephen Glass, uh, Jason Blair figure here, uh, making up fake sources and fake quotes. Apparently he invented a cousin of um, Roof the Shooter down in Charleston. Greg, don't you think people would have figured that out eventually? <laughs> Probably. Right? Like, you just, you know, you know, like at some point, somebody's going to look at that Roof family tree assuming that it splits and uh, they just notice that there's no branch over in that direction, you know, that this guy, but apparently, so he does this and it works for the intercept, which is, you know, one of the newer sites. I believe it's the one that Glenn Greenwald was involved with. Um, the staff from the intercept is off, you know, but they, they let him go when they figured out when the other reporters uh, demonstrated the quotes were fabricated and, and things like that. And they are just absolutely horrified uh, and say, this actions are heinous. It should be fully investigated and prosecuted. Uh, but then the whole idea that he did this because of a breakup with a woman and he was trying to frame her for it. Uh, and apparently he had been tweeting out and was tweeting out stuff. Oh, there are kids in these JCC centers who could do something like this when it was him the whole time. I mean, this this is a uh, Dagwood sandwich of crazy. Like, there's just <laughs> layers to this, Greg. So um, thank goodness he's going to be behind bars. Hopefully this is a crack in the case. It helps us uh, uncover other folks. It also is a slight warning to those who kind of jumped to conclusions, said, aha, well, there's got to be some bad Trump supporters. Uh, you know, Trump has those white national supporters, and you know, they hate the Jews. So obviously this is, you know, uh, by the transitive property, this is Trump's fault. Well, I, this guy is not a Trump fan, right? This guy is, if anything, like you want to classify him as left, but Greg, at some point you get so crazy, not even I want to pin this guy on the left. Right? <laughs> this, is the, this, this, guy's, this guy's not right or left. He's from Mars. Um, and so, you know, thank goodness he's off the streets. Uh, this poor woman he's been harassing and, and stalking certainly uh, must be breathing a little bit easier. But man, oh, man, you know, 
We attract nothing but the very best in journalism, <laughs> huh, Greg? Uh, Jim, I don't know if you made the reference on the podcast or after we stopped recording one day, but uh, your words of Jerry Orbach as uh, Detective Lenny Briscoe come to mind here. We got a real solid citizen here. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure because if you then his at least last I checked, his Twitter feed is still up there. Uh, and in between, you know, claiming he's being framed for uh, uh, play, you know, making bomb threats, in, you know, claiming that this ex-girlfriend is making the bomb threats. Um, there is just one crazy stuff. You, you fully expect for him to have purchased the Nike sneakers and the purple robes and gone to join the Hale Bop comic cult. I mean, this guy <laughs> is out there with um, Kentucky Governor Steve Brashear, I believe, uh, it was, you know, in that group. So, um you know, you, you think you know crazy, Greg, and then you find out, no, no, crazy has all whole new levels you never uh, you never expected. Oh, man. All right, let's move on to our second good martini now. And uh, Colin Kaepernick is not the craziest person we're talking about today. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> That's a high bar to clear. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, ESPN, the story actually broke yesterday, uh, courtesy of Adam Schefter. Quarterback Colin Kaepernick will stand during the national anthem next season, sources told ESPN Thursday. Kaepernick no longer wants his method of protest to detract from the positive change he believes has been created. He also said the amount of national discussion on social inequality, as well as support from other athletes nationwide, including NFL and NBA players, affirmed the message he was trying to deliver. As a means of protest, he began sitting during the national anthem in the 2016 preseason before taking a knee for the final preseason contest and all 16 regular season games. Here's the important part. Kaepernick will opt out of his contract with the San Francisco 49ers on Friday and become a free agent next week, sources told ESPN. So, Jim, uh, very convenient timing here as 31 other teams are on the mind of uh, Colin Kaepernick. He's basically looking for a job and uh, trying not to be a troublemaker. Convenient. Yeah, I was quite proud of my headline, Greg. After further review, the player stands. Um, <laughs> in particular, he's reviewed his contract options in free agency as long as he is the most controversial player in the NFL. Now, I, I quoted a bunch of uh, sports writers in the morning jolt today, Greg. I, so you're deep, you know, we, we, were, we were bothered by this. My bother, my, I, I'm not bothered by an NFL player being left of center or being upset about police brutality or anything like that. I think we just felt like refusing to stand for the national anthem, um, besides the fact that we knew this was going to set off a million and one imitators and it would turn into this competition of who could be uh, the the biggest, most bold protest to the national anthem. We always like to think the national anthem was kind of above protest or, or not not worthy of protest because it's about America. And no matter what, you know, for America's a flawed country, but we still love it. And this, I felt like uh, Colin Kaepernick completely misinterpreted what everybody else in that stadium was doing when they rose out of their seats, covered their hearts, removed their hats, uh, and stood for it. It was not to say, oh, we think America is perfect, it's certainly not an endorsement of police brutality. It's certainly not an, you know, saying America has no problems. But we love it anyway, the same way we love our families, the same way we love our friends. Um, we accept, we, we aim to be a more perfect union. And we acknowledge the achievements. And yes, we always recognize we have work to do. But we take one moment before beating each other's heads in on the, foot, on the field <laughs> to all stand in one and say, hey, we, we built something special here. And I, I kind of felt like the objection to that, like he... he you know, and then you throw in. Obviously, he thought he was wearing the Fidel Castro shirt. Uh, if you think police brutality in the United States is bad, check out the Cuban <laughs> secret police. Um, then, of course, he didn't vote in 2016. And I think it was Stephen A. Smith. We know. Um, I'm not gonna. I, I don't have the direct quote in front of me, uh, Greg. But it was some version of "You cannot not vote in 2016 <laughs> uh, and still consider yourself a political activist." So here he is, and now all of a sudden he's going to stand. Deep down, Greg, we all we all strongly suspect this is all about the free agency. It's not that he, you know, I mean, but again, alternate explanation. Maybe race relations really have been fixed under President Trump. Uh, <laughs> America has been made great again, and everything's great. And if so, wonderful. But it's, you know, the cynical explanation is going to be okay. He wants a big free agent contract, and he knows he won't get it so long as he is extremely controversial. Well. If he's doing the right thing for the wrong reasons, Greg, should we feel good about it? Um, should we we gotta still be upset that he hasn't? We don't suspect that he hasn't really changed his perspective on the country. I I, I think you know the the easiest thing to do, Greg, is just kind of to chuckle at you know, oh, <laughs> oh now now that it might cost him something, all of a sudden he's willing to stand. So um, 
Uh, I I give you a very sarcastic salute, Colin Kaepernick. <laughs> I have nothing but the warmest of feelings for your newfound appreciation for this great country of ours. <laughs> That's exactly right. It reminds me of the, the first Austin Powers movie when he comes out of uh, being frozen and they say the Cold War is over and he assumes the Russians won. And then they then he gets informed that the, actually the, the West won. And he says, oh, yay, capitalism. In a way, this is why it's our, our second good martini of the day. Capitalism wins. Capitalism <laughs> has driven him to do the right thing. And uh, hurrah for all of us, I suppose. Excellent. All right. Well, let's move on to the crazy martini now. And uh, just yesterday, we were talking about uh, what a North Dakota congressman said about the outfits that some of the Democratic women were wearing at the Trump speech on Tuesday night. And how uh, that might not have been the smartest move. Well, let's talk about it from the other side. Cedric Richmond is a Democratic congressman from New Orleans, and he was speaking earlier in the week. Obviously, after that happened, he was speaking at the Washington Press Club Foundation. And the issue from his remarks that's getting the most attention was his reference to the photo of all the leaders of the historically black college colleges and universities posing with President Trump while Kellyanne Conway is kneeling on the couch uh, as she tried to get a picture of the group. And here's what he had to say about it. And you even mentioned Kellyanne and the picture on the sofa. But I really just want to know what was going on there. Because, you know, I won't tell anybody. And you can just explain to me that that circumstance, because she really looked kind of familiar uh, in that position there. But So Richmond eventually on Thursday insisting he did not have any sort of um, distasteful intention behind the remarks, saying, quote, since some people have interpreted my joke to mean something that it didn't, I think it's important to clarify what I meant. Where I grew up saying that someone is looking or acting familiar simply means they are behaving too comfortably. Jim, will get to a couple other Richmond quotes in just a second, but uh, how's that explanation flying with you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. There's nothing sexual about the really look kind of familiar in that position there. Right. I'll rant and rave about this in a second. Was, from that audio, I, I'd read the statement. I hadn't heard it until you just played it, Greg. So really no laughter at that moment, huh? <laughs> Meaning even everybody in the room recognized that that was not a uh, appropriate comment uh, and that he was going in a direction that he really shouldn't. Greg, there are a lot of times the conservative gripe about biased media uh, and a double standard can get can get tired, can get overwrought, can be inappropriately applied. But this is a case where let's picture I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna name a Republican congressman because I don't want to be but let's let's picture a Republican congressman from a very, you know, can safe Republican district. Uh, there's a similar set of circumstances as like Valerie Jarrett in that kind of position. And he says, Oh, you know, I wonder what Valerie Jarrett was doing in that position because it seemed familiar. Can you imagine the category five storm of you know what that would come down on that Republican congressman and deservedly so, right? I mean, it's just this, you know, this, you know, look, there's like Kellyanne Conway. There are days I like her, days I don't like her, but you know, you're not supposed to just be able to make these kinds of comments with absolutely no consequence. I noticed that Sarah Live decided to portray her as some uh, sex crazed stalker in a sketch a couple of weeks ago. Look, this is the woman, for, you know, whatever else you think of her, she's the first uh, woman to be the campaign manager of a successful presidential campaign. You would think the feminists would say, hey, you know what? That's something to be proud of. You know, good feather in your cap, Kellyanne. You would think they would kind of instinctively defend her. But because she's on the wrong side of the aisle, because they really don't like her boss, you can say anything and nobody's going to object to this. This is a ludicrous double standard. And yes, I understand he, he, he was one of those, well, I'm sorry if you were offended. I totally didn't mean that uh, <laughs> utter BS excuse that nobody believes there. So I am, uh, I, I am deeply uh, frustrated by the lack of accountability for, for uh, Congressman Richmond and uh, – Certainly hope that he gets a little more pushback from this. Um, also, similarly, if feminists are wondering why so many people tune them out and don't take them seriously, it's because of this on-again, off-again, like a light switch application of their ideas and standards, that they would find this unacceptable from so many people. But uh, African-American congressman who's a staunch Democrat liberal, ah, we're not going to enforce that. Um, and that's why it indicates that ultimately their primary priority is politics not the actual appropriate treatment of women uh, in all circumstances. Jim, before we get on to the other two Richmond comments uh, briefly, 
How much of the controversy, and while it is different, we probably haven't seen too many people kneeling on a White House sofa in, in the Oval Office, how much of the Democratic uh, hysteria over that photo is because they don't want people to pay attention to the fact that Trump met with about three dozen leaders of historically black colleges and universities? The moment they said, you know, ah, oh, what terrible decorum. I'll just skip over. We can insert any Bill Clinton joke in the Oval Office we want here. But like, oh, oh, the, the knees on, on the sofa? Really? Like that's, you know, like like all of a sudden this is the new standard? Decorum, right? You know, this is probably not even, like of the most 100 worst things the Trump administration has done in the first six weeks or so. Feet on the sofa, it's not that, guys, all right? And, you know, when you start grabbing onto this, it's very, very clear. You you will not say, oh, wasn't that a nice, you know, that he met with them. Oh, here's, you know, outreach. Um, uh, Trump isn't as racist as everybody's been saying. You know, he's definitely trying to build bridges. Instead of any of that, you got to find something and find something new to attack. And that's why I think the news media just got utterly exhausting. And my fear is that someday Trump will do something genuinely objectionable. He will do something genuinely bad because uh, I don't trust him to be conservative down the line at all. And when that happens, people will totally tune it out because the media has turned into the boy who cried wolf and just shrieking and hang haranguing and nagging and screaming the entire time uh, like a toddler. Uh, we we, just, we that they've they've completely blown up their credibility and they won't have it when they need it at some point in the future. Okay, let's talk about the other comments that Cedric Richmond made. Uh, one of them he addressed to April Ryan, who must have been in the audience. If you don't know, April Ryan is a black woman who's been a reporter uh, covering the White House for a long time in Washington. And at the Trump press conference, she asked about whether Trump was meeting with the Congressional Black Caucus, and he asked her if she wouldn't mind arranging the meeting. Uh, and here's what Richmond had to say about that, because he thought that the only reason that he asked Ryan to do that is because she was black, and he was putting himself in her position. I'd have said, sure, boss. Let me call Harriet. We're going to go use the Underground Railroad, and at daybreak, I'll be back with an answer. <laughs> the sad part is, he probably would have said, great, do you need train fare? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not really my president, so I can say those jokes. <laughs> not really my president, and then he took this shot at Steve Bannon. If somebody can talk to Steve Bannon, and tell him that he either should cut the side of his hair or get a stronger mousse so that it would stay down because every time he goes to his meeting, I know exactly where he's been because when he snatches the hood off, the hair comes up. Jim, uh, again, if this had been a Republican, this person probably would have their office packed by now. Yeah, I'm trying to uh, go down in order. Um, if you want to say Trump asking the reporter to set up the meeting was a little presumptuous, uh, I think that's fair. I think it's not her role. Um, I think that, you know, if you, you, he can get a certain amount of gripe. I don't think telling the reporter, here's what you should have said. <laughs> that's, that's every bit as presumptuous, right? Let this reporter do her job the way she wants. She's a grown woman. She's perfectly capable of handling all this stuff. Stop second guessing her and Monday morning quarterbacking her and saying, well, here's what you should have said. Um, secondly, the, uh, you know, not my president. Look, this is the art, you know, I was arguing about this with some conservative bloggers earlier this week. Greg, you know, there's this argument on the left, liberalism is a mental disease. And I think it's a little overwrought and harsh to people who are on the other side of the aisle. But let me get an observation. How many times have we encountered someone and they kind of basically believe with their mind that they can change what actually is happening in front of them? And you could pick, you know, Rachel Dolezal might be the most perfect example of that. But they say, not my president. Actually, he is. <laughs> you may not like it. You may object to him. You may, but he is still commander in chief. Those those Marines on, on Marine One are still going to salute. His status as president doesn't require doesn't require you to uh, like it or see it. You don't have any ability to say, well, he's not the president. And presto, changeo, he's not right. What you're basically doing at that point is you're denying reality. You are you are walking around saying, no, no, the sky is green. The sky is not blue. Right. So the idea that congressman is running around and saying this is not particularly encouraging. And then finally, the last point on that. Look, you know, if, well, yeah, when you've got me defending Steve Bannon, then you've really fouled up, Congressman. <laughs> right. You know, oh, it's a Klan joke. Uh, you know, and oh, he's making fun of his hair on his appearance. Uh, you know, like, again, if you if if this if this was not a partisan Democrat from a partisan Democrat district, um, he would not be able to get away with saying these sorts of things, these sorts of things that have consequences. 
And, um, you know, it, it's the, it's reflects the media that these sorts of comments don't really interest them. Whereas, you know, Todd Akins was national news for the better part of a year. Yes. And every Republican was tarred by it. By Absolutely. The Asked, you know, do you agree? You know, you know, imagine every member of Congress and the Democratic side saying, do you agree with Cedric Richmond's uh, pers- First of all, actually, I would love to see congressional Democrats ask, is Trump your president? Now, I bet you a lot of them would say no, which is, you know, not good for the country. But the second thing is, do you believe it's appropriate for Congressman Richmond to tell the African-American woman reporter how she should have handled that situation? <laughs> Let's put them on the spot and see how that plays out. I suggest, Greg. Jim. We need the weekend. It's here. Yeah. Happy Friday, everybody. <laughs> Rest up. See you Monday. See you Monday, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks very much for being with us. Have a great weekend. And join us on Monday for the next Three Martini Lunch.